in the province. Dr. Banile Masuku is speaking. Uh, the late uh, Honorable uh, Mapiti Matsena, who is laid uh, to rest uh, in his hometown in uh, Limpopo. We also today welcoming back the Premier uh, <coughs> to full health. Uh, he'll be joining us in the coming uh, week when we do our weekly media update. Uh, he has actually probably, we can say he has recovered completely and uh, we are just trying to onboard him on the latest that we have been doing and he will be coming on board uh, in the coming week or so. Uh, like I've said, this is the 20th week of uh, the response to the pandemic and uh, we have been quite open and transparent with all what we have been doing as the Gauteng uh, Provincial Government. And uh, this we have repeated in all uh, earnest that these are the six pillars that our response is actually uh, based on and uh, we have been working on all these six pillars uh, ever since. The one important fact that we also want to mention is that our work uh, is not without any faults and we are continuously improving our systems and improving the response to make sure that it becomes so much accurate and precise and decisive in most aspects. We must also accept that it has not been a very easy time as the pandemic evolves and as the situation evolves in the country. We had to also make sure that the response remains relevant. This is the start, what we normally present, which is a national picture which is the picture that uh, usually is presented by the National Minister through the NICD, uh, which all of us receive before we sleep every night. And it just gives us an indication that South Africa has become uh, within the top five of the countries that has got confirmed cases and active cases internationally. Uh, and we've got 408 or so confirmed cases with almost half of that uh, of those patients having been recovered. And our number of deaths is 6,093, which is something of worry uh, because we don't want uh, to be losing uh, lives unnecessarily. And every life uh, does matter in this regard. And we are in the business of saving lives. So the response also has to look at all the aspects of making sure that we do have adequate uh, staff, adequate beds, and adequate uh, resources to make sure that you are able uh, to save lives. It's also important that we mention in this regard that the tests that have been conducted have over, uh, have passed the 2.5 million mark, and it's something that we, we appreciate in terms of the capacity <coughs> that our laboratory services have been able to put up uh, going forward. This is just a graphical representation of what the picture I've shown you in the previous slide. You will realize and also make sure that you understand that as of now, uh, Gauteng is an epicenter and we said it before that we are now in the middle of the storm. And, and 36 or so um, uh, confirmed cases, 36 or so, 36% of all the cases in the country are found uh, in Gauteng and over 42 percent of active cases are found in Gauteng and this is a figure that makes us uh, the epicenter and also makes us the, the whole attention uh, of the pandemic coming to actually uh, Gauteng. This is the this is the number of the recoveries we want to also indicate to you that our, our recoveries have been increasing quite nicely in terms of uh, the numbers that we have been having. At the current rate, we are almost at uh, 77,000 recoveries, which is closer to our half, uh, almost 52% of all the uh, confirmed cases in the country. But in terms of our contribution to recoveries in the in the in the in the country, uh, we are now, you know, the leading in terms of the recoveries because of 33 percent of all recoveries are coming from uh, Gauteng. In terms of deaths, 
deaths, like I've said, these are regrettable deaths and we normally want to express our condolences to the families and friends and colleagues of all those who have lost uh, their loved ones and also in this point appreciate uh, the role that is played up our healthcare workers who took effort and make sure that they tried to save lives and we like to appreciate their effort and also um, uh, uh, indicate our our, our, our appreciation in that regard. This is a graph that we normally show you, which clearly demonstrates how the pandemic is evolving in Gauteng. And you'll realize from the past weeks, we were worried on how the green graph was actually moving away from the pink graph, uh, the pink graph being the active cases. And now you see that it started now to show and become uh, what we really want to see you know, which the green graph, uh, which is recoveries, representing recoveries, starting to be more than or even go further uh, from the active cases. And the point of intersection for us, it gives us a bit of hope and excitement that, uh, yes, indeed, this uh, virus or this pandemic can be beaten uh, because the majority of uh, those who are infected, they do recover and without many of the sequelae uh, problems. And this is how we are looking at it now, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite hopeful. It gives us hope and courage that we should be doing more and putting more interventions in making sure that this green graph does approach also even the blue graph, which is something that we are hoping to see in the coming uh, weeks uh, or months uh, forward. This is the number of cases. Uh, now, we, in this point, we compare from previous week to uh, the, the current week. And just to emphasize the point in terms of the confirmed cases, you'll see our, our increase has been very uh, up, uh, drastically up uh, from last week. Last week we were on 117,000 cases. Today we are on 148,000 uh, cases. And also of importance is we have increased in terms of active cases to around 70,000 from around 65,000. And in terms of recoveries, we also have increased tremendously, which is one thing that I've indicated before, that it gives us hope and it gives us courage on how we can be able to defeat uh, uh, the pandemic and defeat the virus. And the more the recoveries, the more the, we are actually giving a, a hope and courage in that regard. The death still, repay, the mortality rate still is around 1%, which is something that we'd want to keep it there. Though any life uh, lost is a regrettable point, and we like to express our condolences in that regard. This is a, a, a graphical picture of the new cases per day. You will see how our graph is you know, looking at, and we are hoping that uh, this graph will maintain its uh, 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 downward stride. Uh, we are not yet excited about the downward stride because it's not really saying that the pandemic or we are over the peak. It just means that the must, most of the efforts that have been put in are working and we just need to continue to put more efforts and interventions to make sure that the downward trend gets sustainable and it's something that we are looking forward to. So not to belabor the point, you will see that ever since we had our highest point, uh, highest number of uh, daily increases, which was 6,531 on the 9th of July, we have never seen uh, such a, a, a spike ever. And we did have one of the lowest uh, on the 20th of uh, uh, July, where we had one of our lowest daily increase, which was, which was around 3,000. But it's a pattern that we are observing, and it's something that uh, also gives us courage and, and, and strength to make sure that we are able to move uh, in this regard. This is the next one, which is the, the regional breakdown, you know, like in terms of representing what our regions, our districts in Gauteng have. You know, we do have five districts and Johannesburg remains one of the highest. In essence, what we normally say that 85% of all the activity of the pandemic, you find them in the metros, the three metros in the province, Johannesburg, Egruleni, and, and, and Tswane. Our worry is, is just to see the number of uh, 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 the number of active cases in Sidibeng, which in terms of the per capita in population, is something that worries us. We are, like always, having to work with NICD to try and get rid 
and make sure that we are able to reduce the number of the unlo- unallocated uh, actual figures, which also continues to rise and it becomes a worry point. And as the data continues to be cleaned up and processed, and unallocated figures, uh, we expect them to actually be lower. This is in terms of the sub-districts. Uh, you'll see that the sub-districts that have got the highest cases are found in uh, Johannesburg, and, and this is one of the things that made us to even take an effort from the side of the command center and the nerve center of the, of the, of the public health response to visit one of the areas which we found to be very problematic in terms of active cases, and we will give report as we go on on what we found and how we're going to be moving forward in that regard in terms of what based uh, approach and activation. This is in terms of the highest confirmed cases and active cases per, per district. Like I've said, Johannesburg still remains uh, you know, the highest in this point. The next slide will, will actually talk to uh, the highest number of recoveries. Uh, which is, uh, you know, before that, maybe just to talk about the highest number of active cases, which uh, will be in Johannesburg, and followed by worryingly, like I've said, by Mfuleni, which is in terms of the per capita population, it's something that has to be uh, sorted out, and we will have to visit them and see how we can be able to put in some intervention to make sure that we are able to control uh, the spread in that area of Mfuleni. This is just the highest number of recoveries. Uh, as we have indicated, that we are going to be seeing more recoveries in the coming weeks because the number of those who are hospitalized still remains pretty much constant uh, within what we, we, we have been expecting in terms of the percentage. And those who, in the, in the main, are recovering are those who've got mild and even uh, actually moderate symptoms. But it's important to maintain and also say that, yes, we do have discharges. People do leave our hospitals alive, even those who are in the highest group uh, of, of, um, uh, of risk, the highest uh, risk group, they do get uh, actually discharged and they do uh, re- you know, recover. This is the daily increase in, the, uh, in terms of the cases per sub-districts, which is something that we normally demonstrate to check where the hotspots or the areas where we need to put focus on. This is the the, just the breakdown on the death uh, in terms of demographics, in terms of gender. Like I've said, the area that is a big problem is the one on the, on the, on the, on the age group 50 to uh, uh, 80, which is becoming a, a big problem, like I said. But they do, we do have some um, uh, people and, uh, who have been infected who recover, even though they are within that uh, high-risk group. Uh, the next slide just talks about the comorbidities and, and the days that um, comorbidities uh, that we have. You'll see like we have dem- they demonstrated that hypertension alone is a big problem, hypertension, diabetes alone is a problem, and combined the, the bulk or the majority of all our patients who have passed on, uh, they are actually having the, all these comorbidities of hypertension and diabetes, which is something that means that there they are some of the aspects that we need to look at in terms of our lifestyle or non-communicable diseases uh, actually going forward. This is the days of uh, the number of days uh, of people who have passed on, the number of days that they've spent uh, from diagnosis to the death. You will see the majority of them still remain between one to three days, which is a good uh, indication uh, uh, of us, not people not seeking help quite early, coming to hospital whilst everything is almost late and the complications are difficult to manage. One of the things that we have appreciated about the management of patients with COVID-19 is early intervention and it's early uh, management that is required. That is the reason why it's, it's so important for us to, to make sure that uh, those who require help urgently they do get it, and we know oxygen, uh, IV fluids, intravenous fluids, and also some anticoagulants, uh, they do come in handy in this regard. Maybe just to also mention whilst we are here that we are dealing with a number of uh, individuals 
you know, a company that is bringing remdesivir into the country, uh, one of the drugs that uh, has been licensed and has been seen to be uh, quite beneficial in treating uh, patients uh, with uh, COVID-19. And we are working with them on how we can bring in more stock and be able to utilize that stock uh, within our, 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 our hospital so that we're able to save lives. The dexamethasone it has been, uh, been used and we are continuing to use it. Hence, I think it contributes to the low number of our mortality rate uh, in this space. This is a, a slide that deals with the number of our provincial figures. Like I've said, next week when we come together, we will be clearly be over a one million test, which will be a very big milestone that in 20 weeks uh, as a province, we're able to test over one million people uh, or having had one million instances of testing, uh, which is something that uh, is a remarkable feat uh, in this regard. And Gauteng still remains the bulk contributor uh, to this one. And the more we test, the more we reduce the productive rate and how we, we, we actually determine uh, the positivity rate that uh, we need to uh, actually lower and continue to lower. So the more the test we do, the more we know the status of, of individuals, uh, the better. But also in this regard, it's important to mention that uh, we have changed, uh, we have changed our, um, our, our strategy in terms of testing. Those who are tested now, in essence, are those who are in hospital and our healthcare uh, workers who are the most uh, highly you know, infected uh, in this regard. And it's something that is important that we emphasize that our testing approach has been uh, changed because we also still want to save and reserve the testing kits, particularly for those who will require and need it, particularly those who are symptomatic and, and, and who require hospitalization or medical help. This is just a scenario which in the coming week we are going to share with you uh, the progress that we've made in the past two months between June and July and see how far we are. But this is just what we've been using as a basis for our planning and our basis of our resourcing of the, of the, of the, of the department. It also speaks to uh, where the, the, the peak would be, uh, which we have always said that it will be towards mid-August, towards the end of September, and hopefully uh, as we are in the middle of the storm, when we get there, we would be having enough experience in dealing with the pressure and the stress that comes uh, with uh, dealing with the storm. The next slide just deals with the number of infrastructure uh, beds that we have put in. Last week, you would recall that we had over uh, 8,700 beds, but in the past week, we have added a, a couple of uh, beds, including the ones in the field hospitals. You see the, the additional field hospitals that are continuing to be added. We are looking at Nazrek, which the, uh, is one of our field hospitals, and we need to be very proud to indicate that the beds that we are adding uh, in uh, Nazrek, they do have a, a capacity to, to be escalated, to give oxygen, and also to be able to give uh, some intermediate care in this regard. And work will be starting in earnest in Tswane, to make sure that we continue to add these beds. And as we, yesterday, we welcome the, the additional boost in terms of resources uh, uh, that have been allocated to the fight against the pandemic. But this is just an indication of what we have been putting up uh, in the space. This is the work that uh, will be there, uh, that uh, is continuing in terms of the APT, uh, Alternative Building Technology, which is a word that will be repurposed going forward. This slide, you will see how uh, uh, different it looks from what it was before, but it's just an indication from, your, from our point of view of the number of patients that are in our hospitals, in the public sector, and those who are in the private sector, and those who are in high care uh, and, inter, in, in intense, and high care and intensive care units, and these are patients that require more attention and that we are continuing to uh, observe and actually monitor. This number is, is becoming, um, I think from last week, what we had was around 5,000 uh, or so, 700, and now we're on actually 7,000, just as an indication of the pressure and the intensity that we are feeling in our facilities. In this regard, we are 
uh, perfecting, like I've reported three weeks ago, that uh, we are having a bed management team that every day, every morning, every, every, every night, they do a bed count and make sure that we're able to direct the traffic and to direct the traffic flow of the patients where they should be admitted. I think the most frustrating part would be that when people require a bed and they might not be able to find it, but this team uh, makes it easier for us to manage uh, that particular aspect. At the current moment, the EMS is the one that is doing it quite well and we are continuing to utilize that aspect. This slide is just indicates the number of the public servants in Gauteng that have tested positive and you see the number continues to go up because these public servants, they do stay in the communities and they, do, they will be affected by uh, some of it. I know that I did indicate uh, last week that most of our public uh, health care workers who were found to be positive uh, in three institutions are people that were not working directly in COVID wards but working in the facilities themselves. And that doesn't suggest that we mean that uh, they've, they've not uh, gotten infected from uh, where they work in the hospitals or clinics. But it's just an indication of the survey that has been done in those particular facilities where the majority of those who were found to be positive are not those who are working in the COVID wards, but are those who are working in other wards and in other areas in our facilities. So we are not downplaying the issue and the importance of us as government to provide adequate training and adequate PPE of quality. Yes, I did indicate last week that we are now dealing not only with the numbers of uh, the quality, the quantity of the PPE, but just to continue to improve the quality uh, actually thereof. And we do welcome uh, in a feedback from our healthcare workers where they found that some of the uh, 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 PPE is of low quality and you know, those companies they should be uh, 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 actually uh, dealt with in a manner that they will make sure that they do provide uh, quality PPE going forward. And we sadly we have lost 12 educators ever since uh, one administrative assistant from the Department of Education which is a, a big loss for us you know when we lose our our educators, it becomes a, a big problem. We also this week report we have lost a, a professional nurse. Like we indicated as a Gauteng provincial government, we like to express our sincere condolences to the family, colleagues, and friends of those deceased and also uh, express our appreciation to the healthcare workers who have put in effort in trying to save uh, their lives and uh, managing their uh, disease. This is just the indication of the PPE on stock and it will indicate to you that this is what uh, we have on stock. You will see the number continuously go up because we don't want to get to a point where we, we don't have enough uh, PPE. In this point, I'll, uh, I'll just cover the food, the food aspect of it, that we are approaching a 2 million mark, uh, which will be one of the great needs, a uh, great fit that we would have achieved as the Kauten provincial government. It means these are the number of people that w would have touched and also contributed uh, in the food relief uh, scheme that we're having. And our call center continuously to, uh, gets increased uh, number of calls uh, to make sure that we're able to deal with it. So in the next slide, we're just going to deal with the issues of education, which uh, the HOD will gladly assist us uh, in that regard. Uh, thank you. No, thank you very much. The, the progress that we are providing on education would have been in the last week of what happened up to today. However, you may know that the, pres the state president yesterday also made announcements of the decision of cabinet at the national level. But what we are giving as progress as at the 23rd of July, without moving away from the decisions that were taken by cabinet yesterday, you'd know that since we had open schools in, in, the, in the province, there had been 
schools that had to open, but due to cases of COVID that were reported, they had to close. You will see that of the 2,131 public ordinary schools that we had, there were 218 that had to close and be disinfected and open again. Similarly, there are schools that were taking care or that are for learners with, that require special education needs. And in this particular regard, of the total of 103 schools that we have in the province, we had about 35 of them having to close. And the, the reasons for the closure of such would have been in terms of the aspects of safety that we have to look at. Similarly, independent schools, we also track, although they would be remaining open as pronounced by the president, we have had to look and we were able to record that 97% of independent schools in the province had remained open. Only 3% of those had been closed. One of the elements that we always track is that during this time, what is it that happens? While we're opening schools, is there attendance, but is there any teaching and learning that's taking place? Our statistics had, had shown the number of areas and of, of attendance, both of learners and teachers, and you will note from this slide where we begin to give an indication that the level of attendance of learners for grade R was at the lowest at 22%, but we had an average attendance of learners for grade 12 at 65%. And you, you would have heard also that the president in his announcement yesterday, he made the point that we are only going to give grade 12s only one week break, uh, commencing the close today, they go on a break today, uh, from today and they only for one week. And you can see that in Gauteng we had about 65% of learners attending on average in the week uh, that is just concluding. At the level of teacher attendance, in the same way we, we would have had uh, the greatest number of teachers attending are those that were teaching grade 12 at 71 percent, 68 percent for grade 11. And the reason that you may ask is why such uh, levels of attendance on, on different days you would know that the, there would be a, either a scare at a particular school and therefore a school has to be closed. But similarly, there would be teachers that would have also applied for comorbidity, that have comorbidities and we have had to deal with cases like that. What I also wanted to indicate is that as a result of the level three lockdown process, but equally where we have had anxieties at different levels of society in respect of the growth of the pandemic, there are many parents that had also opted for uh, home education. And our stats indicate to this, uh, to this extent, I must indicate that the department ordinarily approves home education. However, in this period, we've also seen an increase in parents that are applying for learners requiring home education, and those numbers begin to give you a number that, that, in, that, that, have, that it applied. What becomes important is that over and above home education, which is when a parent decides to take their child away from school, and they are not registered with any school, but the parent takes responsibility for the education of the child at home. As a result of COVID-19, we have had to deal with uh, what we, we call lockdown learning. You'd understand that there are learners that would have presented with comorbidities or having underlying conditions, and as a result, should they be mixing or should they be interacting in spaces that may not that are confined? It may create a problem, and therefore, lockdown learning opportunities that the department had provided had ensured that we we also, as part of social distancing, but maintaining all the other COVID proto protocols, uh, we are able to deal with. You will see from this slide that we had received a, a total of 1,325 five applications. So these are in addition to home education applications that uh, parents would have given and we're giving you a cent, the numbers that we had applied, that we have approved and those that we are currently processing as well. And maybe just to indicate what does home learning and lo lockdown learning in our context would, would mean. In respect of lockdown learning, it still suggests that that learner is still on the register of a school and they are linked to a school. And on a 14-day on a cycle, a school is required to provide and give a learner 
worksheets and, and the relevant work that they've got to be doing. And after every other 14 days, that the learner would then be able to submit that information back and the teachers would be marking. And therefore, the assessments that the learner does are still co controlled and catered for at the school level. So these learners are still on the school register, uh, registers of those specific schools. But there's, an, there's a tendency that we have picked up that becomes a, an element that we want to warn society about, is that as a result of lockdown learning and home education, we have also seen the downside of it that there, are, there have been many uh, illegal schools beginning to mushroom. And we want to warn the public against illegal schools that we cannot have, parents must be aware of sites that offer tuition and they offer it in the, under the guise of lockdown learning of, or home education. And we, we want those that are operating such sites as well to desist from doing that because there are clear regulatory processes that we follow in respect of which we can have uh, independent schools applying in, in the current context. And it is in that context that we want to indicate and guide parents to be careful of these mushrooming uh, entities that purport to be legally uh, registered. COVID-19 cases in schools have been on the rise, but to an extent that we, we have been able to respond together with the Department of Health, you will see that a total of 1,660 schools had been affected, had reported a case or so in the province. Um, in the province, we, we have a total of 2,300 public schools, and you will see that number begins to give you a breakdown. Of that number, in, in terms of schools, we had just over 1,500 uh, cases of young people uh, that were affected. Now, you would ask, what is that number? If you were to, I'm talking of 1,538 in the context of close to 600,000 learners that would have come back. So there, there are 600,000 learners that, that, that would have come back during this period, but only 1,538 would have been affected. In respect of educators, we are talking about 1,308 educators, the number for admin staff we're giving. And we have given a cumulative figure that since the reopening and the up to date, the number of cases that we have had in, our, in the schooling system was to the tune of 2,045 cases. And as we indicated that the over this period, there are 218 schools that had to be closed and then uh, be, uh, uh, go through a disinfection process and then be, be reopened again. Of importance is to know that there have been regulations that we published that suggested that if anybody has a comorbidity or an underlying condition, such a teacher or an official must be able to apply so that they can then, we can, the system can then deal with the necessary administrative processes for substitute and so on. In this particular regard, you would know uh, that it, it had also been indicated that persons that are over age 60 were also vulnerable, especially when they have underlying conditions. We give you a sense of the numbers <coughs> that uh, we have had to deal with. In Gauteng, we have just over 3,600 uh, persons on our on our payroll that are above that are 16 above uh, that were in in, in this in the schooling system and therefore we have had to address those specific number of issues the other matter that becomes important is that when the president announced that schools will be taking a break he said while we take a break we are going to provide nutrition for learners that qualify for the school nutrition program at this point in time, when we started with the re phasing in of grades, we started with 183,000 of, of the 600,000 that were qualifying. The 600,000 came back, but only 183,000 of those were qualifying for nutrition. And you all, you'd know that there's also a court order that had been issued in this regard. On average, we now are feeding in all of our schools 1.1 million learners. And these are the number of learners that on a daily basis will still require that they go back to school, that they are able to get, uh, to get feeding, and therefore uh, so that on a, uh, we can deal with uh, uh, the, the issues of nutrition in that particular regard. What had also become important is that we have been tracking as a system not only about whether people are coming 
or whether there is teaching and learning. We also had to look at the well-being, the psychosocial well-being of both the teachers and, and learners alike. And what we had picked up, that because there were, there were learner, uh, uh, levels of anxiety that were beginning to impact on on the attendance at school, and I've shown you the number, of the percentages of persons that were coming, and and these these were emerging trends that we had to begin to look into, and 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 therefore strengthen our psychosocial services to both teachers and learners alike. The the one last thing that I want to talk to is that while we are talking about COVID and and the close and and the pr pronouncement that would have been made by the by the president, it's important to take note that. We are also, while we are still in 2020, we are also dealing with preparations for the new academic year. We do know that in Gauteng we have an online application system, especially for grades one and grades, grade eight learners. And these are the two grades in which we make sure that we use an online system so that persons, and, and the online system is also to mitigate against the effects of COVID, that parents don't have to go to schools to, be, uh, to go and apply. They can apply using an online system, and that system we are able to gather that data equally. We've also ensured through the system that they do not have to be going to schools to submit documents, as had been the case before, and now they are able to submit documents. They can upload documents online, and therefore it has helped us to minimize the movements and, and traffic that we had at schools. Why we are raising this is because our online application process closes tomorrow. So for parents that have young people, who are starting grade one in 2021 in Gauteng public schools, as well as those that are starting grade eight, need to make sure that they go to our education portal and go to www.gdadmissions.gov.za and make sure that they apply to the schools where they would be wanting to send their, their children to. Uh, person, let, let me say lastly, Following the President's announcement, I think it's important that we reiterate and give indication of the following. That we, it has been indicated that the, the, all the grades that were in school that had returned, and in this case, in Gauteng, we're talking about grades 12, grades 11, grade 7, and grade 6, as well as grade R. All those grades are going on a break. And it's a four-week break that starts today, 27th July, and it will end on the 24th of August. In the same vein, we do know that grade 12 learners will only have a one-week break, meaning they will be away up to the third, and they will come back on the 3rd of August. And we know that the grade sevens will have a two-week break, and they will come back two weeks after from today. And lastly, we, we want to indicate that in the week of the 27th to the 31st of July, um, that's, the, that's the period when the teachers and grade 12 learners are going on break, and afterwards the teachers and learners of grade 12s would have to come back to school to start prepare, preparing. And finally, I should indicate that on the 17th of August, because the entire group would, would come back from a break on the 24th. It's important to also indicate that then on the 17th of August, our teachers would then have to come back to school to start to prepare for the grades uh, that would have been on a break and that are returning. What, what, one other information that we have also received, while the president would have indicated that the minister is going to give further clarification, we do know that there are directives that, or directions that the Minister of Basic Education had issued and we will continue to take guidance from those directions that the minister has issued. Thank you very much. That's all we have for now. Okay, uh, thank you, HOD. Uh, I think uh, maybe we do the closing remarks, let me see, and then we will take questions. Take questions. Or should we take questions now? Okay. <coughs> questions? Let's start here. Okay, can we move the mic over there?
ich äh, euch jetzt ein bisschen äh, Marketing von der SABC. Uh, just the first question that I want to ask, uh, which is currently happening, uh, there are students or nursing students that are currently protesting at uh, Aninsky uh, Nursing College, just next to Helen Joseph. Uh, they are saying that uh, there's the issue of PPP is there, and that's the reason why they're protesting. And the same applies to um, a nursing college next to Barabana. Uh, they are actually protesting about the same issue. We know that uh, these students are actually assisting at these hospitals. Are you aware of these issues? Um, and what are you going to do about it? Okay. Do we have any other? No more questions? Well, it looks like today we don't have lots of questions. I'm trying to see here if we have any question from WhatsApp. I see there's a question here from Kasi Disabled News. Senzekile. What is the Department of Health doing to bring the or to bridge the gap of communication between the deaf community and health workers? Um, okay, yeah, that's the question from Kasi Disabled. These are the only two questions. I don't see any more. All right, we'll answer those and then uh, proceed to do the closing remarks. Let me see. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. We, we are well aware of the protest. It started yesterday in Krisani Bara College. And uh, it's something that we are working with our administrators in the Gauteng College of Nursing, GCON, uh, to make sure that necessary PPE is provided. There is something that normally we do encounter as it relates to PPE provision at a cold face level. It's just the management of the, of the stock by the facility managers or supervisors at the ward level. And I'm certain that that will be dealt with because we do have enough uh, PPE provided uh, for all our facilities. And this also includes for nursing actual students, including uh, our medical uh, actual students that also come into our facilities. But it's something that we'll get report on and see what is the progress from the GCON because it's a, it's a matter that the college itself must be able to deal with in terms of this uh, actual protest. And... I think they had given an indication that they will provide and be given something more extra, which we do agree with, uh, that the face shields and the masks are becoming a, an important aspect of uh, PPE, not only uh, the mask and the apron, but I think just an additional mask. But it's important thing that we do indicate that um, this is one of our major uh, uh, um, uh, preoccupation to make sure that we are able to protect those who work in our facilities or who get training in our facilities. I think the issue on bridging the gap in terms of communication, communication is a big aspect uh, in this regard. And I think we are working, uh, should be working in a project to make sure that it's not only about the deaf, but it's also about people who speak different languages to make sure that that gap is a, actually a, a thing. So we are looking forward in getting a, a, the project going and see how we pilot it in one area and see how it, it develops further and make sure that it becomes a, the norm in our facilities. The second part on the communication is one that deals with the uh, patients that are COVID positive who are admitted in our, in our wards. We, we are also working with the civil society and the NGO sector to see how we can be able to put in place a program where uh, the family members uh, could be able to get constant and uh, a, a reliable feedback on their loved ones who are admitted in our facilities. It's something that we saw 
as a big gap uh, with the, all the regulations that are coming up on COVID and the lockdown, not allowing a lot of visits. So it's an important aspect so that the families are able to communicate and those who are admitted as patients, they're also able to give feedback uh, to their families on their on their on their state and how they are doing but it's work in progress we have spoken to the COVID-19 front uh, who will uh, come up with a, a, a proposal we've also uh, had a discussion had a telephonic discussion also with uh, uh, some uh, leaders of um, the civil society uh, who have actually given some ideas but it's something that we're working on communication becomes important uh, in this regard and we know that it's a it's one of those that uh, we need to improve going forward uh, just to also do the concluding remarks on the on the media brief uh, is that ours uh, as the spread is continuing as we are in the middle of the storm our objective a primary focus is still be about saving lives and that's what our comprehensive health has uh, response has been all about we have upscaled a number of uh, activities in this regard, uh, which will help us to minimize community transmission. One thing that is important, uh, that has been expressed as in the most important aspect of the work that we have to do, is the one that uh, deals with uh, identification of positive cases, expeditiously tracking and tracing contacts, and making sure that we are able to early put up medical management, management and intervention, particularly for those who need it. We also need to work towards making sure that uh, decon uh, of making sure that our facilities uh, in line with social distance regulations were able to decongest them. So the, the, the central uh, medical dispensing system is strengthened. I think we are closer to uh, getting uh, almost a million people who will be registered on, the, on that uh, actually database where they will receive their medication uh, at their local pharmacies and also from our community health care uh, workers. The other important aspect is just to continue to refer those who require isolation and quarantine uh, for them to be able to get away from where they, they will uh, exacerbate or help in spreading uh, the, you know, the virus. And also we are heightening our awareness and our public health education in terms of the prevention strategies. So this is still remains the key element of our response, particularly at the level of what, uh, uh, of, of, of wards and, and, and local uh, municipalities. Also this week, we, uh, the team, like I've said, uh, visited areas in Orange Farm, which is one of our areas of concern. Uh, and where they were, they were able to work with our community health care workers who were continuing to translate into full-time uh, personnel into the department and were quite excited with that uh, 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 intervention, but we were able to visit 1,700 households and also uh, just reaching over uh, 5,500 uh, people in that regard and doing a whole lot of health training not only COVID, but also HIV, BP, hypertension, and uh, actually um, uh, diabetes. And this is something that we are doing with the uh, uh, help and work with COCTA, uh, the Department of uh, Cooperative mm -hmm. Government. Dr. Bandile Masuku on the podium there, giving an update of the Gauteng Command Council's response to the coronavirus. In the beginning of that briefing, he was saying Gauteng is now the epicenter. 36% of all cases in the country are found in Gauteng. Over 40% of active cases are in Gauteng as well. And he spoke about the large recovery rate that there is. There have been 1,187 deaths recorded in Gauteng. And then Edward Mosue, who's the Gauteng Education HOD, also speaking, saying over 3,600 people in the Gauteng payroll are over 60 years old and are in the schooling system. That's one of the issues and challenges that they have to face. Obviously waiting for direction from Basic Education Minister Andrew Motsecha as there's a lot of anxiety from parents over what's going to happen with schooling. We know that there's a break and teachers are going to come back on the 17th of August.